These men are entering a cage. They are being committed to a state prison. Each one of them has offended the values of our society in one way or another. Now they are leaving society behind and going into a new world that has its own values. They are losing their freedom. To some, this is a new experience. To some, this has happened before and it may happen again. But always, entering prison stuns a man and dazes him. Okay, man, I'm going to give you an envelope piece with your name on it. Would you put your property that you got in your pockets inside the manila envelope? Any rings, wallets? As they surrender their property, small things like rings, wallets, half-finished packs of cigarettes, they may feel for the first time that they are surrendering their individuality. To become a number and a piece of space inside a cage. Take all the cigarettes out of your pockets, everything you have. <coughs> Would you get undressed, please? But there is more to give up. They must enter this new world just as they entered the free world outside when they were born, naked, carrying nothing. The process is necessary and is not intended to be demeaning. They must be separated from possible contraband. They must leave behind as much as possible of the life that brought them here. No, no socks, no clothing whatsoever goes inside. Roger Mudd for CBS Reports. When you think about it, there are just a limited number of things a penal system can be asked to do. In the first place, it can be asked to punish those who break the rules. Paying a debt to society is a familiar phrase, and societies all through the ages have collected such debts from the offenders. But most civilized societies have not been content with the punishment. They want the punishment to have a purpose. And that purpose might be to prevent individuals from offending again and to deter others from ever committing a crime. So now we have two, to punish and to deter. There is a third akin to these, and it is simply to take the criminal out of society, to remove him from temptation, to put him on ice, to retire him. All these objectives have one thing in common. They line society up against the offender, trying to control him by menacing him. Most nations, including our own, want to move a step beyond this. They want to move closer to the prisoner and try to change him so he will not offend again. This gives rise to another purpose of the prison system, rehabilitation. What is our penal system like? A good way to begin finding out may be to discover what the prisoners are like. What is our system up against? The prisoners can tell us. What do you think uh, lies behind your being in this place? Mm -hmm. Got off to a wrong start, a young kid, I'm at it. I come in here when I was 19. I've been here 16 years. 16? Mm -hmm. Robbery with? Robbery with a gun. Then murder after I got here. And murder after you got here? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Whom did you murder? Well, I was convicted of murdering an inmate. So what kind of a sentence do you have now? Life. And what does that mean in practical terms? Forever. Means my, forever? In my case, forever. You're sure of that? From every indication you get from the Authority, yes. All right, what does life look like to you now? Very dark. No ray of light? No, I wouldn't say there was, no. You get mad, angry, this? No, no, you don't get mad. You just, no, let's take it as just one of these things and go on. Yeah, but one of those things in one life is more than too there's, much. There's a lot of difference, but... In a place like this, you, your mind gets stagnated. You, you more or less, you just figure, well, I got it to do, I got to do it, so do it. It's kind of hard to figure how a guy who, on the surface, is so amiable could get into such a fix as you're in. Oh, well, my amiability has become, in the past five, six years. When I came in, I was, I was pretty tough, <laughs> pretty ornery. You were tough and ornery. 
Yes. Were you also mean? Yes, very mean. Young, wild, didn't, it just didn't care. I really don't know what made me go wrong. Except I started out when I was a kid, stealing little things. And then I, I progressed. And when they put me in a federal correctional institution, it was the nearest thing, if not a penitentiary. It was the nearest thing to a penitentiary. There were adults in there. And I had to fight my way through it. And I got beat up many, many times, very badly. I didn't know anything really about crime until I went there. And they schooled me. And when I came out, uh, instead of stealing a car or a bicycle or what have you, I was ready for the gun. They taught me that there's only one way to go, and that's with a gun. That's where the money is. So when I came out, I picked up a gun, and I've been in and out. Well, I've been out three times in my entire life since I started, and I first fell when I was 14. How old are you now? I'm 32. And look, 52. Uh, when I first came to uh, prison here some five years ago, I came here and uh, I was under the impression that uh, someone owed me something. This was the way I felt, you know, more or less that uh, I had been done a great misjust by being sent here. But actually, no one owed me anything, you know. But I had to find this out for myself. And I had to uh, go through a couple of years of... Uh, battering back and forth with myself and the institution to find out really what was happening. Uh, How did you find out? Well, after I got uh, two or three frictions with custody, which is the uh, institutional police here, and uh, found out that uh, they didn't care whether or not I did 10 or 15 years or 20 years, you know, it'd be up to you how much time you wanted to do. You know, uh, that they weren't going to help me unless I helped myself. So what are you going to do when you get out? Well, now, I have a whole lot going for me. I have vocational trade, which I've uh, finished here. Who's that? I'm a butcher now. I'll go out of here as a first step apprentice, second step, or third step. I can go out as a journeyman in some uh, fields of the trade, such as a boner. I can go out as a journeyman boner. The world inside is a world men can adapt to, one way or another they have little choice. Some of them are lucky enough or sensible enough to be able to make an adjustment that can be useful to them when they enter the free world again. Many institutions try to help them do this, try to give them work that will prove of some use to them someday. Prisoners teach other prisoners the jobs of the place get done. This idea of trying to improve a man while he serves his sentence is relatively new. These boys are doing time in a Georgia correctional institution that was less than 15 years ago as tough and unpleasant as could be arranged, where the food was bad, where the discipline was harsh and punitive, and where nothing of any use at all was learned. All men were regarded as dangerous and treated as if they were a breed apart who might never enter society again. There are many prisons run that way today. But there is also a groundswell of change in penology. New methods are being tried. Some people are beginning to think life in prison should help prepare men for life outside. That adjustment of thought is not an easy one to make. We have all been brought up to look with fear at convicts without thinking of them as individuals or as men we may someday meet. Father Richard Cronin, a new chaplain at Missouri State Penitentiary, analyzes this feeling of fear and its implications. Well, of course, this is a natural fear we all have when you hear of a person who has done time. Invariably, even when I came in here myself, there was a natural fear of the individuals. And this was a thing I had to overcome by association with them. We're always afraid of the unknown, the unknown qualities. And once we get familiar with them, familiar with the danger, with the attitudes, we find that these were all imaginary that we had built up to an extent. Granted in some that we can have a real fear of them, maybe because of their sociopathic nat nature, but with the vast majority we don't have to fear them. 
And I think this has been exaggerated in society and people are not educated as regards penal work. They have no, invariably it's apathy. The walls hide the problems. We can forget about them, we're safe. But they forget that 90% of the men will be returning to society. There are things the wall should not be allowed to hide. This is the Harris County Jail in Houston, Texas. It is a monument to prison thinking of the past. Here men are locked up in a cage with nothing to do but wait. No communities are proud of such arrangements, but many local jails throughout the nation with no money, antiquated buildings, not enough staff, too many prisoners, are able to do little better than this. The cage is a great leveler. All men are alike here. Some may be in for a few days on a drunk charge. Some may be here for years on graver charges. In practical terms, some of them are harmless people. Others may be dangerous people. There's no way of telling, for all are lumped together under plain punishment. This raises a primary question about the functions of a prison. Does punishment in itself have much effect on men who break the law? Reporter Warren Wallace talks to a man at Missouri State. Checks. That's my greatest trouble, writing checks. It's your weakness. Yes, sir. That's all I've ever been in penitentiary for, is writing checks. Do you find that people are gullible? Yes, they are, sir. How do you account for this? I, I don't know. Um, I, I can cash a check most any place where anybody else couldn't, and they, they just cash it. They, and if I'm short of money or depressed or want a drink and don't have any money or need something I have to buy in material or anything in, in my work, I, if I don't have the money, I buy it. Well, now, when this happens, don't you know in your heart of hearts that you're going to get caught? <laughs> Sir, this is hard to explain, but, you know, it never crosses my mind. I never, th I, I, I never think about it, the trouble, you know. I never think about that till I get in jail, and then I think about it. It don't, it don't uh, worry me. I know it's wrong, sure, but... I, I do it anyway. Of course, I try not to get caught and hope I don't get caught. But. Well, the way you talk, why, it's just going to be a revolving door, isn't it? Well, it looks that way. But I, there's e there's got to be a stopping point somewhere. And it, I think it's up to me to stop it. A man who loses his liberty suffers the basic punishment. It makes him lonely in a crowd, lonely in a place where no one can ever be truly alone. And yet neither this nor any punishment that has ever been devised seems to solve the problem of recidivism, of repeaters who offend again and again and are caught and put away again and again. Among any group of prisoners like these lining up for lunch at the Texas State Prison in Huntsville, there are many who will come back again to this or another institution after they are released. It is not known how many, but a conservative estimate would put the number of repeaters at over 50 percent. There's no way of telling how many ordinary citizens are kept from crime by the fear of going to jail. But the behavior of the convict population suggests that neither punishment nor the prospect of punishment does much to deter a man inclined to commit a crime. In fact, inside each prison, there exists a smaller model of the problem presented to society at large. For within the walls of any institution, there is always a percentage of men who seem to be bound to get into trouble over and over again, no matter what is done to them. They are repeaters in another sense, persistently uncooperative, 
men who spend most of their time in maximum security cells. Reporter Wallace, again at Missouri State. You're in maximum security now. You can't leave your cell? No, sir. You don't get any exercise? No, sir. Don't see the outside world? No, sir. Don't see your fellow prisoners? Once a week, shower day, come by the cell. It's like old homecoming week. You what? It's like old homecoming week. <clears throat> when they go marching by? Yeah. yeah. So what do you do to pass the time? Oh, just sit around and read newspapers and so They give us reading material down there. You think? Oh, that's about, yeah, a lot of times. What do you think about? It's about every category you can name, one time or another. You lonely? Sure. <laughs> Be crazy not to say I wasn't lonely. You angry? I stay mad. What was your charge against you that brought you here? Armed robbery, St. Louis, Missouri. First offense? No, I've been other places. <clears throat> you think you're a dangerous man? Oh, I guess, yeah. On the street. Never did nothing right out there. Where did it all begin? If I didn't answer, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. When did it all begin? I don't know. As far back as I remember, I've been locked up all my life. Started as a kid? Yeah. I went to Boys Town, Nebraska. Just from there, just, just wild. Spent most of your life in jail? All of it. You think you'll spend the rest of your life in jail? Not a doubt in my mind about it. No sense, you know, trying to kid myself, except reality for what it is. Right now, I got 85 years waiting on me in Minnesota. When I finish this rap here, got to go back up there and finish 85 years. Very unlikely I'll be released. You ever use your weapons in armed robbery? Oh, sure. We're forced into it. What way did you use them? Shoot people. I mean, you know. I figure, like, you know, you walk in with a gun in your hand, the guy's committing suicide, you know, to not acknowledge what it is. Come, I've had people run at me uh, about every kind of weaponing thing. Of, you know, I pitch people th throw pictures of beer at me, things like this, start screaming, get out of here, punk. And, I mean, what are you going to do, you know? The whole object of armed robbery is to pull the job and get away, you know. You're not going to jeopardize that. You pick that gun up, you gotta, you know what I mean. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you, tell you like it is. <clears throat> I mean, it sounds pretty tragic, the truth, but it's the way it is. So you've had to shoot people? Yeah, I've been forced. They forced me to, by their own ignorance. Maybe I was just the, weapon that came along for their release, you know, but they probably want some way out or something. Who knows what goes through people's mind. You think they're committing suicide when they run at you? Well, I've looked at it pretty close. I've had enough time. I've analyzed it, you know. I just can't... I mean, would you let... Would you come running at me and try to subdue me if I had a loaded gun pointed at you? Word, no. Well, you figure it. How do you feel about the people you robbed? Do you have any attitude on them? No, I don't try to have any, uh, you know, personal feelings toward it. It's cold, you know, I mean. Do you ever have the feeling that what you do is morally wrong? Oh, sure it is. Definitely it's wrong. Not that stupid. I know right from wrong. Do we know any more about the basic function of a prison? These men are exercising at San Quentin in California. On the evidence, it does not seem that special punishment or punishment in general has a lasting useful effect on them. Now they are on ice, out of circulation. Yet someday they will, most of them, come back into society. They will know more about punishment than they did when they came in, but they will also know more about crime. We shall explore this in a moment. Good on in a 
Commander. Men are taken prisoner and deprived of their freedom because they have committed crimes against society. But there is one thing done by rounding criminals up and herding them together that society never bargains for nor wants. And that is the negative effect imprisonment has on many men. These cowboys are all prisoners at Ramsey State Farm in Texas. Every one of them is a Class A trustee meaning that every one of them has been carefully judged and tested by the prison authorities and found to be absolutely trustworthy in prison. And yet one of these men is serving a life sentence as an habitual criminal. Outside in the free world, he cannot be trusted for a moment. Inside, he can be trusted to ride the range freely without supervision, doing his job and coming back to his cell block when the job is done. The real prison for these men stretches as far as the eye can see. And yet the habitual criminal is, in a sense, penned in as tightly as if he never left his cell. For he has been judged by society to be able to make it here, but nowhere else. So this is one unwelcome thing that happens to men of widely different types in prison. They become institutionalized. Behind the bars or behind the boundaries of their institution, they are model prisoners. But remove the bars, separate them from the prison herd, and they are no good at all. Some of them learn other skills as well, skills that make it easier for them to fall when they get outside. For if you pen criminals together, they will teach each other the finer points of crime. Is there any way of preventing our prisons from becoming schools for habitual crime? We asked a convict at San Quentin. Well, one thing I would do for the biggest thing, I wouldn't put young boys or young men in with, I'm gonna, I hate to admit this, but I'll say with a criminal like me a thief like me. Uh, I don't I have I don't believe they have any business mixing with my type. I I've, I've done a lot of things that uh, I'm not proud of, some that I'm very much ashamed of. And I don't think these boys and these young men, first termers should mingle with us because we talk about these things. We'll tell them how to commit crimes. This is just a natural thing in prison. I just have a new cell partner. I got him about three or four days ago. <laughs> and we stayed up until midnight every night uh, talking about the capers that he's pulled and I run around my little scenes to him. Well, this, he's 25 years old. He's been in before, but he's, he can be repaired. But he, I don't think he can be repaired here. This is worst place, this and Folsom is the worst place they could put him. Because of his youth, and he's good looking, and he's young, and this is a bad combination. What can you do to a man to change him for the better? These young convicts are reshaping hillsides to prevent erosion at the Ferguson farm unit in the Texas system. They work in highly disciplined teams. Right along in there now, chop down on it. They work under the gun. Work it out. Now carry it back. Carry it back, carry it back to the bottom. They must learn to pull together. Straight back. They are doing long hours of work that might be finished in half an hour with a bulldozer. Chop it off in the ground, Latner. Way down the ground. On the other hand, they are making a good job of it, and in another season, they will see this eroded area green, reclaimed for grazing. There are dogs to chase any runaway and pull him down. There might be arguments about whether or not work done under the threat of guns and dogs, movements performed on the double, will have any lasting good effect. 
But with society's efforts at reclaiming people up to now earning such scant success, who is to say? The logical way to begin any effort at improvement would be to reach for contact in areas of a man's life where he began to go wrong. Almost all prisoners have one thing in common. They were not able, or not willing, to make an honest living. So it's reasonable that most prisons try to teach men to work persistently and effectively at some task that is directly useful to the institution, if not to themselves. Another thing common to most penal systems is to place increasing emphasis on training young offenders. The average age in state and federal institutions is 28, which reflects a growing population of younger inmates. And whatever the age of any inmate, nine out of 10 will have started to move outside society, beginning to get into trouble at an early age. For a long time, the men who administer prisons have been asking a double question that springs from this fact. Why do young people go wrong? And who goes wrong? If we want to do more than just lock men up, if we want to get to them, these questions must be answered. We talked with Fred T. Wilkinson, director of the Missouri State Department of Corrections and for many years a leader in prison administration, and asked Mr. Wilkinson, what sort of person goes to jail? I would say the person who is most likely to go to jail, and this would be about 90% who go, is a person who lives across the tracks, who's really poverty ridden and is a victim of environment. Uh, there isn't any question about this, and it has been uh, far more so since the close of World War II with the tremendous urbanization that we're going through our huge cities. People come into marginal areas and they're living in these areas and they have very little to do. They're not prepared to cope with these communities and the communities are not prepared to cope with them. And so they begin, uh, it may be a youngster who forms a pattern if you study it, who has a gnawing belly, he's hungry and he begins to steal and he at school, he's not the same as the others. We say we all have equal opportunity. This isn't true at all. The kid who's dirty and hungry and uh, going into a school that is supposed to be, he's supposed to be equal there, is not going to get uh, the equal benefits of the other fella who's well fed and who was driven to school and things like this. So eventually, this is the thing I think that leads to it. Uh, there are lots of things in between, of course, that happen, but basically environment is the principal thing as far as I'm concerned. This is a picture of a bird with a long neck and a round body. So if we would help, we must begin at the beginning. You all see this? This letter looks like a bird with a long neck and a round body. This is the word bird. Say bird. Bird. Say it again. Bird. Say it again. Bird. In many places, as in this Georgia State Prison at Reedsville, it means beginning with the ABCs. Bird. Bird. These men have a long way to go, and yet they are among the elite of the prison population. Most of their cellmates are out working in the fields or on road gangs or the like. This is a picture of a cup. Sometimes inmates can teach and very likely it helps them to help others. Spilling coffee. This is the word cup. So just as useful work is one step up from punitive confinement, learning is another step up from that, a step toward the goal of finding a life outside. Sound k say k. Who was Joan of Arc? Jimmy? Sometimes teachers come into the prison from outside. Tommy, who, who was Joan of Arc? Uh, she was a woman that uh, uh, dressed as a soldier and led the French troops to a victory uh, in Orleans. All right, what was the name of the war? The uh, Hundred Year War. The Hundred Year War. Danny? 
It was difficult to learn before outside in an ordinary school. It is difficult here. Sometimes what must be learned for that vital diploma seems a long way away from this or any other life these young men have known. They have failed outside. Now they must succeed here. Okay. Your basic problem seems to be with the reduction of improper fractions, where your denominator is smaller than your numerator. Sometimes the things learned have an immediate and practical usefulness. In this case, the answer would be seven and two six. But you can't stop here. You must reduce your fraction by. But always the goal of re-entering society remains at the end of a scale of opportunity. I think that uh, privilege should be given to each man. A man ought, ought to have a chance, if he wants it. Put him on a trial basis for anything else, but give every man the chance. Because self-respect is one thing that a man has got to have. Without self-respect, uh, there's gonna be a return. And this sure does give you a, an insight helps you look within yourself, you see. It opens your mind, starts you to thinking. Uh, the help that, that we've received out here has not been on a custodial basis. It's been more or less on a man-to-man -man basis. The million one things runs through your mind when you start getting ready to get out because of the uh, situation you're placed in once you get released. See, a felony, when you walk out the door, unless you've got some, a family or some friends, uh, you're up to Burville Creek. And uh, that $8 don't go far. So uh, it, it does scare you sometimes to think it. I mean, you hate this place. You don't want to come back. But you try living off $8 or trying to get started on, on, on a trivial amount that they try and make a man leave here with, I'm not saying it's, it's their responsibility, you understand, but uh, <laughs> it's just impossible to do. And a man that's got, got no friends or nobody to go to, there's not one course of action he can follow. That's to steal again. And ultimately, he's going to return. This building in Oakland, California, represents an attempt on the part of that state system to help ex-convicts over the difficult step to freedom. Whatever a man may have accomplished or failed to accomplish in prison, it is bound to be hard at first to walk free outside, to find a job, to start life up again. With this in mind, experiments have been launched of providing halfway houses, where an ex-prisoner must stay until he has made a start. It is different from parole, where a man is left on his own with only the duty to report regularly. The inmate of a halfway house is closer to the prison situation, in that he has to return each night to the house where he is fed and lodged. He is committed to being there, but has freedom of movement during the day. When he returns, he must sign in, listing the time and putting down as well what he has been doing during the day. Looking for work is a common entry. The experiment is new. It appears to be showing some good results. Certainly help of any kind at this stage is needed. But it is often very hard for an ex-convict to find work. Many people do not want to trust such a man with a job, with any responsibility. Why should they? He has demonstrated himself to be irresponsible by getting into prison in the first place. He has committed one crime. Possibly he will commit another. Why take risks? And more than that, many men emerging from prison have no particular skills. That may have been what helped to put them there in the first place. Reporter Wallace talks to one halfway house inmate. What kind of work are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for anything from ditch digger to salesman right now. And what kind of luck are you having? Uh, none at all. Why not? Well, if you put down your record, they say we'll call you, and you never hear from them. And if you lie about it, like I've done in some instances, then they wonder about the three-year gap that I have in there between jobs. What do you think it does to people to be in prison? 
Well, it does different things to different people. What did it do to you? Well, it made me feel guilty, of course, being there. And hostile in some respects. I, I was pretty mad about being locked up and everyone else is wandering around. Do you think you were unjustly locked up? As far as the law is concerned, I, I committed a crime and I was paying for it. But you felt that there was an injustice in this? Yes, I, I do. In what way? Well, for my conviction, it's... Now they're talking about uh, cures for it rather than, than punishment. What was your problem? It was marijuana, smoking marijuana. And that was the extent of your crime? Well, not actually. While I was out on, on bail for my second possession, I burglarized a doctor's office to obtain more drugs. So that one, that one they had me on. I did something wrong there. What kind of drugs are you looking for? Any kind. Why? Well, they gave me a good feeling. I, that's where I like them. What kind of drugs had you been using? Well, marijuana, stimulants, uh, heroin, morphine. Now, what about trying to find work? What sort of places do you look? Just factory work, service station, odd jobs. Just look through the paper and see something and apply for it. Sometimes I tell the truth about my past and other times I try to make up things so it doesn't go against me. Do you think being in prison did you any harm? Yes. What sort? Being confined, you don't feel much like a human being after that, after you're locked in a cage for three years. Of course, it used to be thought that anyone who committed a crime was dangerous. Mm -hmm. You would be called dangerous. Do you think you are dangerous to society? No. Do you think you're a drag on society? That's a possibility. Can anything else be done to prevent men from being a drag on society? More of this in a moment. There is another kind of bridge between the prison and the community that is being tried in a number of places throughout the nation. It is to send convicts out from the prison by day to work and have them return at night. This man is an inmate of the Elmwood Rehabilitation Center in Santa Clara County, California. He is due for release in the near future. In the meantime, county jail administrators have found him a job outside and every working day he goes out to perform it. He must register his time out and his expected time in. He is given a lunch to take with him. Lunch? Yes. Now he is in the free world on his own with a job to do and a set of rules to live by. No liquor, all money accounted for by the institution, no larking about. He is a man who has been judged capable of accepting trust and responsibility. He drives his own car to work. Santa Clara County has had inmates punching time cards outside the jail since 1957. This idea of releasing inmates to work by day was first tried in Wisconsin. It is now being tested in North Carolina, Michigan, and Maryland. The results to date are very promising. In Santa Clara County, California, nearly 2,500 inmates have taken part in the program. Less than 1% of these have yielded to temptation and wandered off, an escape record better than most lockup prisons. And the 99% who have stayed on the job have served their time and re-entered the free world with a real start. Now the Federal Bureau of Prisons has started its own work release program in 30 institutions armed by implementing congressional legislation. In factories such as this one in Danbury, Connecticut, convicts come out to work alongside free men and women. They put their hands to new skills that will serve them in the future. They earn regular pay and send it to their families or bank it against the time they will be released. This program is not intended as a substitute for punishment. Men are not eligible for work release until they have come close to the end of their sentence, until they have proved by their work and behavior inside the prison that they deserve this new opportunity. 
The Federal Correctional Institution at Danbury has 70 prisoners out of a prison population of 700 working at jobs in this Connecticut community. 11 of those work here at highly skilled jobs, manufacturing components that go into air and spacecraft. How do they fit in? Do they get on with their fellow workers? Do they do a good job? Well, uh, I'm an inspector, and uh, where I've had contact with them in regards to their work, they seem to have a healthy attitude. They're interested, and uh, they try to do good work, and they uh, take correction without uh, any resentment or anything. They seem to have a healthy attitude towards their job. Well, for one thing, we're not confined. We're out here. We're free. We're just like any normal person out here. And uh, in fact, they don't even know where we're from unless we tell them. They treat us the same. We work by, we work with us. They try to help us. Nothing to it. I was really surprised to find. I mean, I was working with these, you know, the men for a couple of months before I realized they were convicts, and I didn't know it then until I was told. They didn't seem any different. Oh no, definitely not. Did it scare you when you found out? No, I don't think so. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for them. What do you think the main purpose of it is? For the convicts to work here? Well, I, I feel that uh, it gives them an opportunity to make money for their wives and children on the outside, and it helps pass their time, and it gives them a skill so they'll know something when they go on the outside. The job has done more than helped. It's given me a chance to, to feel like I'm, con I've, I'm contributing to my family again, where uh, one who's in prison gets stagnant. He, he feels uh, helpless and hopeless because he, can't, he just can't do anything for them. You actually feel free when you're outside, and you actually forget that you're a prisoner. This is true. They've got to pay their uh, punishment. That's what I figure. They've got to do that somehow. But in a way, it helps them when they do get out. I realize that. In what way do you think these men pay their debt? Well, they're paying it by being in, because they're not really free, even though they do come here to work. They're still not free. They still have to go back every night. A lot of town man does a bid like me for instance five years. And uh, he's uh, been going a long time. He goes out with nothing. So what is he going to do if he can't get a job right away? So he's got to turn to crime. If this way he go out, he'll have some money. And uh, it could last him over until he can find a job, maybe a month, two months. It's all depending on how long he's been on the program. So I think this is a wonderful thing. In Danbury, we talked to Merle Alexander, director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. We asked him what general theory lies behind the changes that are taking place in prison administration. For every person that we don't intervene in his delinquent career, we have a person who is not going to produce in society. He's not going to pay taxes. He's going to infect the community in terms of his associations with other people. And this becomes the new, critical, important role of the prison is to carry out the order of the court in confining him in an institution, keeping uh, him from his liberty, and then gradually restore him to, to liberty. There is plenty of punishment in being sentenced to a prison and taken from your family and normal life and placed behind walls. Well, uh, is it true that uh, no longer in, in modern penology uh, the directors are guided by the old phrase, uh, he who sins must suffer? Well, uh, it's quite true that this alone, in terms of purely punitive, retributive kinds of, of uh, mass repression in prisons, is... Uh, uh, being abandoned gradually uh, by the part of prison directors throughout uh, the country, and indeed throughout much of the world, because it hasn't uh, uh, paid off, because we haven't been able to d demonstrate that, that uh, repressive measures, or the lash, or physical punishments, or whatever this is, uh, uh, pays off. It, it tends to embitter, and tends, it tends to uh, uh, confirm criminality just as the kind of an institution in which you have mass idleness. I visited an institution not long ago in which over a thousand men out of 3,200 were unemployed. They had no, no employment, they had no factories, they had no training. 
and in a cell house with 600 men confined in cells all day long with guards patrolling the corridors, smoke, talk of sex and crime. This is easy. This confirms criminality. You and I living two or three years under those conditions uh, wouldn't be the same kind of, of people. How could we be useful contributing kinds of citizens? Uh, we've tried now for a hundred years to lock people up and hold them and when the sentence is up, uh, uh, turn them loose. This hasn't worked. The rate of recidivism in the country is now 50 or 60 percent. Upwards of three-fourths of all crime committed is committed by people who have already been in prison or in probation or parole. And one of the critical steps now being taken is to extend the control and supervision of the prison toward the community, providing very, very close, gradual supervision and release on the hypothesis that uh, this breakdown, which has occurred repeatedly, can be prevented through the kinds of methods now being used. What have we discovered? Men are in prison because they have committed offenses against society for which society demands they be punished. Within every prison population, there will emerge a percentage of inmates who may merit and profit by exceptional privilege, who may go out into the world, as these men are doing, mingle with free men, learn and grow, and who may carry back with them the benefits they have gained. We have seen as well that there are men who seem to be beyond the reach of any efforts to correct them, who must be isolated because they are dangerous, not only to their fellow man, but even to their fellow prisoner. We have learned that there are gradations up from this to useful work, to privileges inside the prison that may give men motivation. There is education that can be given, skills that can be taught, we have learned, in short, that there are, potentially, stages within a prison system that reach upward from total failure through degrees of partial and tentative success in changing a man to the point where some can be equipped to re-enter society. Since most of the convicts now behind bars are going to emerge one day, changed or not, it would seem that our interests demand that as much as possible be done to change the men who can be changed and protect us from those who cannot. It is obvious that many of the men who run our penal system are well ahead of the public in their dissatisfaction with the way that system has been run. New ideas are being tried and this is a healthy sign. But if the system is ever to be brought closer to the community, Clearly, the community must be prepared to give. Give sympathy, give understanding, give material help. For the basic goal is obvious, the improvement of society itself. Roger Mudd for CBS Reports. Good night. CBS Reports, Men in Cages, was brought to you by... General Telephone and Electronics. G, T, and E, and its family of companies. I know it's wrong. I sing this of you. There's no other way I can be with you. If only your boy would approve. CBS Reports, Men in Cages, was filmed and edited under the supervision and control of CBS News. I can't wait. Come on.